Loch Corrib is Ireland's second largest lake. It's the largest of three lakes situated on the western fringe of Europe that are collectively known as the Great Western Lakes. Its sister lakes, or lochs as they're more commonly known, are Mask and Cara. They have the reputation of making up perhaps the best known wild brown trout fishery in Europe. Loch Corrib also attracts a run of wild Atlantic salmon and grills, which enter the system through a short section of river at Galway City. As Corrib is predominantly a limestone loch, the water is exceptionally clear and there's an abundance of food available for fish to feed on. The trout can be large, very large indeed, with the current record trout for the loch weighing close to 22 pounds. Influenced by the warm Gulf Stream crossing the Atlantic from Mexico, winters in this part of the world are seldom very cold. Indeed, the transition from winter to spring is barely obvious, save for the lengthening hours of daylight. Because of the relatively mild winters, Corrib offers the adventurous angler one of the first opportunities of the year anywhere in Europe to fly fish for wild brown trout. From mid-February, when the season officially opens, fish may be caught using fly fishing techniques in the shallower, warmer bays and inlets of the loch. At this early period of the season, fish feed keenly, particularly on freshwater shrimp, hog lice and fry. This is a time of year when sinking or intermediate lines are used in preference to floating lines. Roy Pierce is a particularly fortunate angler as he lives right on the shore of the loch. From his cottage window, he can watch the seasons unfold and choose the time to begin his year's fishing. He's particularly fond of top of the water fishing. That is when he sees fish moving and fly hatching right on the surface of the water. He prefers to leave the February and early March fishing to those hardened souls not so fortunate as himself he is able to pick and choose when to fish, and Roy is confident that the coming season will provide him with more than enough angling to satisfy his appetite. When he's not fishing himself, he can usually be found acting as a guide and boatman to the various anglers visiting the cottage. By St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th, he's on red alert, carefully watching the water and the skies for the first signs of a relatively large chironomid known as the duck fly. There are many varied species of chironomid, and the duck fly belongs to the group collectively known to anglers as the Blayan Blacks. The particular species, Chironomus anthrancinus, is the one we're concentrating on, the duck fly. There are several reasons given for its common name, but Roy believes that it originated because the first clutches of mallard chicks hatch at the same time as the duck fly and both adult ducks and chicks feed madly on the emerging fly. The beginning of the duck fly fishing is eagerly waited by anglers far and wide. Preparations throughout the winter, cleaning, painting and launching boats, preparation of tackle and tying of flies, all play their part in the build-up to the season. Lines, leaders, knots and flies, all given final inspection before setting off. Time to begin. Excitement and anticipation can hardly be contained. And we're off. Roy sets off with his longtime fishing companion and fly tying mentor, Paul Juras, a regular visitor to the cottage. They're also joined by the first sand martins of spring, they too have anticipated the duckfly bonanza. The secret to successful duckfly fishing lies in understanding the life cycle of chironomids. Settling to the bottom, a duckfly egg develops to a larva stage as a bloodworm, living most of its life buried in the mud and silt, 
not generally accessible to the trout as food. It emerges from the mud as a pupa, ascending through the water column, developing as it does so from a slim, sleek pupa to a pupa with an obvious thorax, ready to emerge at the surface. As it reaches the surface, it's delayed slightly as it breaks through the surface film. It is further delayed as it emerges above the water from its shuck. At this stage, it's called an emerger. Paul has spotted a rising fish and Roy manoeuvres the boat by a stroke of the oar to cover it. The dry fly can escape the attention of the trout quite quickly in calm conditions, but much more slowly when conditions are rough and windy. The adults make their way to the shelter of land and trees. They gather for mating in huge clouds, and these columns of flies appear as smoke above the trees, emitting the familiar mosquito-like noise which gives them the other name of buzzers. The female completes the cycle flying back to the water to deposit her eggs. Roy selects a drift in front of the cottage, territory with which he's very familiar. Two problems arise for the angler. First, trout can become preoccupied with one particular stage of the duck fly development, ignoring others. Secondly, the duck fly hatch itself is not a continuous affair. They hatch for 10 to 20 minutes, then stop, start again 20 minutes later, and so on. Stop, start, stop, start. What the precise trigger is isn't known. Temperature, light intensity, time of day. Perhaps we're better off not knowing. It certainly adds to the challenge. Duckfly hatch in specific areas known as duckfly holes. These can be as extensive as an acre or as small as your living room. Local knowledge, observation of bird activity and fish movement are critical to being in the right place at the right time. Recognizing the rise form of fish is essential to determine the stage of the duckfly's life cycle with which the fish are preoccupied. Ever-changing conditions add an extra element of complexity to the challenge. Normally I like to see a fish rising ahead of me. At the moment I haven't seen anything. I'm just keeping an eye open as much for a moving fish. One of the nice things about duck fly fishing is that more often than not you're fishing to moving fish, in other words you see a fish before you cast towards it, so the anticipation is incredible. The guides you look for are the gulls and then fish downwind of where the gulls are. A lot of people fish underneath the gulls, I've never found it particularly successful, I think the gulls upset the fish. And there's probably too much fly there anyway, so you're one amongst millions. You should always mark where you see the gulls, so that the next time you fish, if you get there before the gulls, or after the gulls are finished, you're in with a better chance. I'm fishing a team of three flies. Point fly is a pupa pattern, and the middle dropper is a, an emerger pattern. And the top dropper, though I don't normally do this, is, is actually a floating fly. It's a cul de canard. So I'm simulating all three stages of the duck fly life cycle. The place I'm coming to now is. I know from experience is a good duck fly area. And the fly hatch right in, tight to the shore. There's a fish, the first one I've seen now. It's just about two cast distance straight ahead of me. 
the thing to do is to make sure you, you, you don't panic visualize where the fish is so that when you do cast that you're not casting too far or too short um, might just reach him with this cast I'll just give him a go he's down there I'm very careful now I'm going to as I lift this off I'm going to hold the flies in the surface fill them simply because I know there's a trout somewhere about here I will sometimes follow a fly up to the surface and wait until it's literally coming through the surface film before they take it. This particular fish doesn't seem to be in the mood at the moment. Where you get a shoreline with the wind blowing onto it, such as the one now in front of us, sometimes the fish will line up just... There's another fish there now. I shall have a go at him. Just looks just about right. Let's hope he's... Yes, he came to it, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't get it. Uh, I never. I didn't tighten in there because I didn't see the line move at all. He possibly came for the dry fly and sort of splashed at it and missed it. Let's give him another little go. Yes. Oh dear. Oh dear. Too quick on him that time. We win some, lose some. There we are. Oh, now what has happened here is. The fish has gone for the dry fly. I felt the line slip, and I think I probably foul hooked the fish on the middle dropper. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if I'm right now. Uh, I think he came for the dry fly. When I struck, it seemed to slip. Perhaps I'm wrong, but uh, he's not a very big fish, so sometimes a foul hooked fish, if it is a foul hooked fish, uh, will fight like a fish ten times its size. What we like to do when, when we're fishing in a breeze is to try to get the fish to behind the boat, as we call it, upwind, in other words, of the boat, so lifting over the fish uh, as, as, as we go on. Sometimes what happens when a fish goes to take a fly on the top dropper the line actually passes through it, through its mouth and then it gets hooked on the outside of the mouth by the next fly coming down but I think I'm correct here when I say that this fish is foul hooked he's caught in the tail I think or in the abdomen somewhere uh, but I knew that as soon as he as soon as he struck I don't want to break in the fish that's why I'm being a bit cautious but he is foul hooked it looks like somewhere near the tail. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure on. And of course they're very hard to land when they're foul hooked. Very hard to guide them to the net. Again, I'm anxious not to break in the fish. Elegant. I was quite right when I first said that he'd missed the dry fly and got hooked again further down. However, it doesn't make them any easier to get into the net as they have all the power of the tail. There we are. Not a very big fish, but as I said, it fights very hard because they're foul hooked. Lovely conditions. For a small fish, it's in excellent condition. And again, a right just hooked by the tail. This fish has a scar from probably from a cormorant in the past. Just see the cormorant mark there. And lovely condition, beautiful fish. Away he goes, fight another day. And the wind has just got up a little bit. It makes it just a little bit more difficult to see a fish. And I think that works two ways. I don't think that the fish are madly keen unless there's a lot of fly to come up in a big wave at duck fly. I think they prefer to fish for their food underwater. They're great opportunist trout, or they'll take whatever comes easiest. And I think when it becomes very rough on top, it becomes too difficult for them to see their food and we go down to grub. The 
this is generally a good little bay for fish now just in front of us so just because it's a proven hot spot I'll stick with it I haven't seen any fish move here now but I'd be surprised if there wasn't something here There we are. Not very big fish, but he's there. I like to get the fish onto the reel as quickly as possible. Just let the oar out of the way so he doesn't wrap himself around that. Again, he's gone for the gone for the emerger in the middle dropper. Uh, probably a better fish now that I've seen him again underwater. He looks a bit better than I thought he was. So I'll just tighten up the tension a notch. And let's have a look at him now, if we can. He's he's keeping his head down. This at the beginning of the duck fly season, fish tend to be keen and eager to feed and are more easily fooled by the various fly patterns presented to them. However, with an ever increasing quantity of fly hatching, they become much more choosy. No sign of him tiring yet. He's, he's not very big now. I'll just get him in as quickly as we can. He's got the leader wrapped around him a little bit, which sometimes doesn't help. They don't give up these corb trout. They've got a, they're in superb condition and got good big tails. small fish give you quite a, a handsome scrap. Don't, again, when you're using such fine tackle that even a small fish can break you quite readily. So just be a little careful. Tension set quite light. The wind is also putting a lot of pressure on. The boat is drifting quite quickly, but now I think we've sort of got them under some form of control. Just guide them along the top to the net. And there we are. Another trout in tremendous condition. Lovely fins, full tail. Look at that. 